Sugar beets were discovered in Europe in the 18th century and for almost 100 years were the main source of sugar in the old continent. In the United States, which recently celebrated the sugar beet centennial, we can find over 100 refineries. Canada and the United States ranks as the two countries having the highest sugar consumption in the world with over 12 billion pounds consumed annually in the U.S. It's estimated that the average Canadian consumes approximately 105 pounds of sugar each year. In Canada, sugar beets were first grown in Ontario, Alberta and Manitoba. The first viable business was established in Wallaceburg, Ontario in 1902 and the Chatham plant was built in 1916. This little corner of the world is of special interest to us as it is situated only 10 miles from Pancor, one of Ontario's most flourishing French-Canadian communities. Before sugar beets were grown in this area, Pancor was merely a small agricultural parish with poorly drained, weed-infested land. The main sources of revenue for its inhabitants consisted merely of crops such as hay, oats and wheat. Today, Pancor owes its prosperity to the sugar beet industry. In this area, we find families with names such as Roy, Caron, Levesque, Gagné, Pinsonneau, Martin, Trudel, Béchard, Trahan, Mayu, and Robert. These families came from Saint-Jean de Tracadie, Sorel, Verger, Saint-Hyacinth, and other parts. Through these families, the virtues of our ancestors lives on. To drain these low-lying soils, long, wide canals had to be built. Because the land level is lower than the level of Lake St. Clair, the water from the lower canals had to be pumped into the higher canals. The sugar beet industry subsidized this major undertaking. Sugar beets require deep soil, cool but not wet. Soil that is suitable for grain cereals is also suitable if well drained. This also applies to soil suited for alfalfa and clover. Depth is essential. Note the depth of the topsoil, which is between 8 and 10 inches. After deep plowing and proper harrowing, the soil still requires a lot of care. The sugar beet grower is well aware that each round with the plow, harrow and roller means cutting back on weeding by hand, boosting water retention and increasing yields. This is open war against weeds. With such radical weed control, the problem should be eradicated in a few years. is used often. It is important to level the soil properly to ensure uniform growth. The seed drill plants the seeds in four rows 22 inches apart. The seed is dropped at a depth of one and one half to two inches. The long folding arms hold a marker which makes a line to guide seeding of the next row. Fifteen pounds of seed per acre are recommended. This should not surprise you. You must remember that sugar beets have a very low germination rate and an extra pound of seed could be multiplied by fifteen at harvest time. Farm manure is still the best fertilizer for sugar beets. However, as with all crops requiring weeding, the manure must be well decomposed to help control weeds. Chemical fertilizers allow for excellent yields. Applications of 200 to 300 pounds per acre of a blend of 2810, 216, 6, or 2126 is generally sufficient. The formula depends on the type of soil and the farming system used. It is always wise to consult your agronomist about this. As soon as the tender green rows can be seen, it is time to use the cultivator. This will not cause any damage to the plants because this instrument is designed for remarkably easy handling. The discs are set to allow for an unturned strip of three to four inches. This machine can do 5 to 10 acres per day.
the roller then breaks up the remaining top crust by crushing the soil, thus reducing evaporation of water, which the plants need in order to grow. The pressure does not harm the supple stems, but allows the roots to establish more deeply into the soil. It becomes a fight for life. The young plants straighten and are stronger than ever. The field is cultivated once again immediately before the thinning process begins. It is time to thin the rows when the small plants have from four to six leaves of about two inches. The tool that is used has a 20 to 24 inch handle. Since the laborer who does this work has to remain in a stooped position, a longer handle would only force him to continuously stand and then stoop again, making the work more difficult. The thinning process consists of removing a great majority of the unnecessary plants. Blocking of beets consists of leaving only one plant every 12 to 14 inches. Both thinning and blocking may be done at the same time. An experienced laborer such as this man can easily complete his daily acre. Following this procedure, the young plants are flattened and seem lifeless. However, it would be useless to support them through hilling because the following morning, they will straighten up, only to be flattened again by the roller. These assaults at their vitality are needed for the development of strong and vigorous roots. Cultivation and rolling should be done whenever there is a weed problem or when the crust becomes too hard. The cultivator must be modified to accommodate the growing plants. The discs are removed and the cogs rearranged in order to maximize root growth. Beets should be cultivated at least five times. The cultivator cannot control weeds within the rows. For this reason, hoeing becomes necessary. In mid-July, the entire family can be found in the field. Everyone's in a good mood, from the head of the family to the youngest, not to mention the oldest. While working, dreams of the future become clearer. The crop promises to be very good, and in the fall, the check from the factory should make everyone forget the long hours of labor. Not too tired? And of course, working in the great outdoors does wonders for the complexion. It is well known fact that growing sugar beets improves the soil and increases yields for other crops. This makes it perfect for rotation. Sugar beets improve the soil with their long roots, which at times reach a depth of over six feet. The roots find underground the water and nourishment they need, where plants with only surface roots cannot reach. After the plants are pulled out, the root tips decompose, enriching the soil with humus and helping aerate the deeper layers of land. Cereals benefit most from the soil conditions where sugar beets were grown. 
In sugar beet growing area, statistics show that cereal yields are 50 to 100 percent higher than in other areas. Yields of 60 to 70 bushels of oats per acre are not rare in Pancor. Alfalfa also helps the soil maintain its fertility when farm manure is not sufficient. Plowing in of alfalfa and clover is the sign of a prosperous farmer. The sugar beet industry goes hand in hand with the dairy industry. Beet leaves, tops, pulp and molasses provide excellent fodder for cattle. The farmer must ensure that these are fed to the cows after milking only, never before, so that the flavor of the milk is not altered. The cost of raising beef cattle is not as great when these byproducts are available. A well-organized farm often has its herd of sheep. Pig farms, together with dairy farms, are the basis of our agricultural economy. Corn production is very profitable in areas where sugar beets are grown. In Pancor, the well-known hybrid corn used for feeding cattle has remarkable yields. Up to 75 bushels per acre of shelled corn are harvested. The Quebec farmers will be interested to learn that some of these hybrids require as few as 85 growing days. Corn harvesting is still done by hand, but today, corn husking is done by a machine. It is clear that the trend today is toward mechanization, which makes the work a lot quicker and easier for the workers. Corn is transported to a grading station and then put in a dryer. What beautiful golden corn! Tomatoes are also a favorite crop in the area. Tomatoes are planted after sugar beets but harvested before. In this way, there is no time wasted for the laborers. Pea and bean crops add the final touch to a well-rounded and prosperous farm operation where good profits are always welcome. Harvesting white beans. Harvesting. Threshing is done either in the barn or in the field with a combine that picks and threshes at the same time.
Here is the field of the famous soybeans, a multiple-use crop that produces a large part of our plastic and oil products. When produced in black soil, sugar beets become very large but low in sugar. It is better to use this type of soil to grow celery, lettuce, spinach and onions. The onions are pulled out and laid in the field. They are then put in crates to dry before they are grated and bagged. Tobacco production is very popular in Pancor. The fact that tobacco plants are set far apart makes transplanting by machine possible. As for sugar beets, since the plants are only 12 to 14 inches apart, the horses cannot move slowly enough to use a planter. Let us hope that a planting machine will soon be available for sugar beets to make this difficult task a little easier. Pipe and cigar tobacco can be grown in soil used for sugar beets. However, sandy loams are needed for tobacco used in cigarettes. It is noteworthy that in sugar beet areas, other specialty crops, however lucrative, have never been able to replace sugar beets. The reason being that this plant has soil improvement qualities for both top and sub layers of the land. Good summer fallow prepares the soil for next year and is part of the unending war against weeds. Here we are at the end of September. The weather is clear and cool. A good day to start harvesting. The lower leaves have already turned yellow. First sign of maturity. A field analysis would indicate a sugar content higher than 15%. Harvesting sugar beets today is much easier than it was years ago. The mechanical lifter accomplishes in a few hours what a man could do in several days. The beet lifter is easy to operate and works very smoothly. The roots are so easily pulled out that a horse can move along at a regular pace without a strain. Four to five acres can easily be lifted in a day. In heavier soils, two discs are added to the lifter to make the work easier. There is also a simple and inexpensive version that the village blacksmith can easily make. This lifter is very practical for farmers with little acreage. This beet lifter works wonderfully. As we say in the farm, you don't even have to hold the handles. Sometimes it's necessary to use the harrow to loosen the roots. Topping sugar beets. The beets are skillfully picked up using a large knife with a hooked point. The beet is held in the left hand, the top is sliced off at the base, 
providing one is not left-handed, that is. A sickle is also an excellent topping knife. Now here's somebody who knows what he's doing. He is doing at great speed one of the most important harvest jobs. In fact, the whole top has to be sliced off, not only the leaves. The top has poor sugar content and if it is not properly cut off, the average sugar percentage of the crop would drop, thus reducing the price paid by the factory. All the green material must be taken off. It is useless to transport waste that cannot be used at the factory. Now here is a perfect topping technique. Another method involves working two rows at a time. A bead is picked up from the right, another from the left, and the two are knocked together to shake off the remaining soil before they are pitched on a pile. The leaves are thrown by these piles and the beetroots are tossed on a central pile for easier loading. The children can make themselves useful and still manage to have fun. They carry the leaves to the barn where they can be used to feed livestock. Look at the size of these roots from a field which has yielded 20 tons per acre. If the beets are not taken to the factory immediately, they must be covered with leaves to avoid losses due to bad weather. The beets are loaded in a wagon using a pitchfork with rounded prongs to avoid pricking the roots. The wagons are headed for the barn where the beets will be loaded on a truck and taken to the factory. A wise farmer can give his arms a rest by using machines at the right time. The factory, situated in Chatham, Ontario, founded in 1916, is the largest in Canada. It produces over 60 million pounds of white granulated sugar annually. Long lineups of trucks and wagons loaded with sugar beets often obstruct traffic on the roads near the factory. A view of the huge loading docks. First, the wagons are weighed. The weigher at work and his booth. A bill on which the weight of the load is registered is given to the driver.
Unloading is done by a hydraulic dumper and sometimes using a pitchfork. These employees move along the wagons and take a half bushel sample from each load. These samples are washed, the topping is checked and redone if not acceptable. Any weight differences due to adhering soil or improper topping are noted. The sample is then sent to the laboratory to be tested for sugar content and the farmer is paid on a pro rata basis. The empty wagons are weighed to determine the net weight of the original load. Not all sugar beets are trucked in. Distant beet producers use the railroad to transport their crop. Wagons with side rails are easier to unload. The mechanical crane is a familiar sight on the loading docks. This huge pile gives an idea of the vast production of sugar beets in this area, over 225,000 tons annually. At times there are so many incoming loads that neighboring fields must be used. On these frantic days, lunch is taken on the run. In spite of everything, this man still keeps a twinkle in his eye. Conveyor troughs are installed under the piles. The strong water flow carries the roots inside the factory. The yards are divided lengthwise into lots. A conveyor trough runs through each of these lots and all the troughs lead to a main one which runs into the factory. The troughs disappear under the heaps of roots. The caps are removed one by one to let the sugar beets fall in and then put back into place before the lots are filled once again. From all sides the troughs continuously carry the roots into the factory conveying over 3,000 tons of roots in a 24-hour period. And now, to give you an idea of the refining process, here is a series of graphics which illustrate the sugar refinery system much more clearly than by watching complicated machines in a large refinery. Ingenious devices clean out the soil, sand and debris still adhering to the roots before they go into the factory. Once inside the refinery, the sugar beets are carried by water into a horizontal cylinder where they are shaken and from where they emerge clean and white. From there, they fall into buckets on a vertical conveyor that takes them to an automatic weighing scale. As soon as the load reaches one ton, the bucket tips and empties its contents into a root chopper, which cuts them up into small pieces. We've now reached the extraction process. An unending line distributes the roots and pushes them into diffusers. The diffusers are connected by a pipe system. Hot water circulates from one diffuser to another, bathes the roots and becomes filled with sugar. After leaving the diffuser, the pulp, which is separated from the juice, is sent to a desiccator in a coal-burning oven topped with a hot air chamber. 
the gases escape through the chimney while the dried pulp is bagged, weighed, and pressed for selling. Dried pulp makes excellent forage. But let's come back to the sugary juice. As is, it contains over 400 foreign organic and inorganic bodies that must be eliminated through carbonation. It is then brought into juice gauges which mechanically register the sugar content and put back into circulation. Lime milk is added to the juice. In the first clarifier, it receives a current of carbonic gas for purification. Through a filter, the juice then goes to a second clarifier for a second carbonation at a higher temperature. It is again filtered and when reaching the third reservoir, it is treated with sulfur vapors. At this stage, the juice is slightly yellowish in color and perfectly liquid. For crystallized sugar, the juice is steam cooked a series of times before it reaches a syrup consistency. Its sugar content is now over 50%. After a last sulfur vapor treatment and a last filtering, the syrup concentrate is taken to a reservoir and from there to a cooking kettle. When crystallization is complete, the cooked product goes to a centrifuge to separate the granular sugar from the molasses. The molasses is sold to alcohol manufacturers and to farmers who feed it to their livestock along with the forage. The white sugar is spin dried, weighed and put into bags to be sold. It can be either fine or coarse according to consumer needs. The sugar obtained from sugar beets is identical to the sugar obtained from sugar cane. Even a chemist could not tell the difference. Sweet, isn't it?